That's the sound of European bison that once roamed much of the continent until they were driven almost to extinction through hunting and habitat loss. Now they've been reintroduced in the southern Carpathians in Romania. It's a lifetime project because it's not just about releasing the bison into the wild, it's also about uh, basically integrating the bison in the social life of the, of the people around this area, right? You know, in the, in the local communities. Nestled up on the hill near the village of Aminish in the foothills of the Tarku Mountains sits the campus of Wiwalda. The we of Wiwalda represents the approach to this project, people working together to rewild bison. What came first was uh, the vision of humans in harmony with nature, really broadly. And of course our bread and butter is conservation and often conservationists don't really, really think or do too much about the human aspect because it's out of habit, it's not how we were brought up, let's say. But times have changed. Wana Mondok was brought in by the World Wildlife Fund to work on the innovation and community development side of this project. Wewilder is a social enterprise founded by WWF uh, employees and some community members. It's set up to be an economic branch of our work here so that we could move this uh, different uh, developments around green economy initiatives, uh, be that ecotourism or different local products or new enterprises which we hope to start with locals. Are you the first of your kind? Yes, we are. I think uh, within the global WF network we work a lot to support conservation enterprises, but it's always quite uh, hands-off and I think, I'm sure, this, this is the first social enterprise founded by WWF. In collaboration with Rewilding Europe, WWF's reintroduction began in 2014. Transports have been repeated every year as part of the Life Re Bison project funded by the European Commission. It's now the largest free roaming population in Romania with over 120 bison. They were selected from breeding centres and reserves around Europe, taking into account age, gender and genetic background. European bison are different to the American species, which have been called buffalo in the US. The American species is heavier, shorter, with a different bone structure and horns. They graze on grass, while the European species also eats leaves and vegetation. It's the largest and heaviest land mammal in Europe, with males weighing up to a ton. By returning them to their natural habitat and giving them space, it was hoped these once captive animals would adapt and thrive. And the good news is calves are now being born in the wild. But how the local population would accept them was less certain. The first bison arrived and there were a lot of community members at first release, like close to 200, and there was a party afterwards and then people asked, so what comes next? And it's almost like colleagues back then were thinking, oh, right, what's next? And so at that point uh, I was lured from WWF UK to answer this question coming kind of a couple of days later. The crew and I are some of We Wilder's first eco-tourists, staying in the sustainable huts built by volunteers and locals. But more about that later, because right now we're heading out to track bison. Morning guys. Good morning. Which is which? Mate, Gabby? Mate. Mate. <laughs> nice to meet Good you. To meet you. Nice to meet you, Gabri. Yeah, hi, hi. Welcome to Armenia. Thank you. Okay, so you will be our tracker for the next couple of days. Yes. Uh, where, where are we going to start? Uh, we'll start just now and we're going to the, to the bison area. And uh, it will be like around 45 minutes drive uh, to, to the bison area, the home bison home range. Now you have what, some GPS on the bison? Do, do we know where they are? Yes, yeah, some of the bison have GPS colors. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have any fresh data from today, but uh, we know the areas where they, they should be, and uh, we'll try to check some of these areas where they like to stay more, and uh, we'll try to, to spot them. Okay, well, let's get going. I'll follow let's you. Let's go. Thank you. So we're now starting to go a little deeper into the, the valley, a little more off-road, and uh, we were talking to the, one of the trackers last night, and he said, um, you're in good hands with Matei uh, because we call him the bison whisperer. 
And considering we don't have any GPS, we are totally reliant on Matei's sense of where the bison might be. We're lucky to still have these large ecosystem engineers. The species only survived because of captive bison in zoos. Then in 1954, they were reintroduced into the wild in Poland and other countries followed. Experienced ranger and guide Matej Mikulescu monitors the herds. And biologist Gabriela Retez is one of many gathering data which will hopefully ensure genetically viable populations in the future. We already have a, a fresh track here. It can be a male because usually they roam around by themselves. So they don't stay. We can also have like groups of two or three males if they yeah. tolerate each other. But usually the big males roam around alone. We'll try to see if the, the tracks are going further up in the forest. Bison are what's known as a keystone species. They can be a plant, animal, fungi, or even bacteria. These species have a disproportionately large impact on their ecosystem relative to their population. Without these species, ecosystems would be dramatically different or cease to exist altogether. We have here, as you can see, a nice trail through thick vegetation here, which is done by the bison. It's one of the roads they have in, uh, in nature. They basically, they create these uh, pathways through thick vegetation where other smaller animals can't cross. Basically, they uh, helping the connectivity to some, uh, in some areas for other smaller animals and they have the same impact in the winter also because they create through in case of a hard winter and a big layer of snow the bison creates like nice highways to the snow which are used by all the other animals to cross basically from one side to the other so how fresh are these tracks the freshest uh, track we have is a, is a male track which is probably from yesterday or from during the night also we are looking for fresh tracks of a herd because it's easier to follow easier to find let's hope we'll uh, find some Matei has told us we need to be quiet while we're tracking them, which is hard for an unfit media crew struggling up steep tracks. Cameraman Daniel and sound recordist Andre are carrying the biggest burden. It's the boys doing the hard yards. I'm just carrying a little backpack. Coming out of the trees, we discover a sunny spot where the bison rested, which is the perfect place for lunch. All made for us by the Wee Wilder team. We can't linger for long, as Matei says, we're not far behind the bison. So you're a biologist. What exactly are you studying when it comes to bison? What's very interesting here is that uh, we are talking about a reintroduced species. So we still don't know how it is going to adapt. Basically, it will be interactions between the species and the environment, but also interactions between the species and the other species, so interspecific interactions. So we are monitoring the whole study area. We are talking uh, more than 300 square kilometres. Something very important is to understand also the growth rate of the, of the bison. So basically, how many bison did we introduce? How many new bisons, so newborns we will have? How many are dying each year? Uh, those dynamics are very important actually, because uh, we must remember, again, we are in a shared landscape and uh, bringing many, many, many individuals, it will mean that we are also having uh, more interactions between humans and bison, so then also more conflicts. And in order to avoid the conflicts, we should talk about carrying capacity. So what's the supporting capacity of this environment? What's also the tolerance of the people? So you don't want hundreds and hundreds of bison. You need to make sure that the, the bison that are here uh, are okay and also interacting safely with people. Exactly, exactly. I was about to ask Gabriella about collecting bison DNA from their scat or dung when our day was ruined. Oh no, this is not good for bison. This is not good at Very all. <laughs> loud motorbikes. That is not good for bison. Not good for bison and not also for the other species. And, uh... Well. Okay, so it's a public space, but yeah, I mean, <laughs> if the bison were close, is, is, have they gone? Yeah, yeah, they will run. They will run because of the noise. Oh. Well, we were meant to go and look for bison now, but I'm, we need to have a little chat with Matei to see what we're going to do, because they were over there, which is exactly where the motorbikes came from. So yeah, we've been walking for a few hours and it could all be ruined. We'll just have to wait and see. 
While motorbikes are allowed in the area, they should be sticking to the roads, but without patrols, it's hard to manage. Our trek is over, so we head back to the Wee Wilder hub. In 1919, the bison were extinct in the wild, and only 12 were left. Yes, you heard him right. A species that once roamed the European continent was almost wiped out, leaving only 12 individuals in captivity. And uh, from those 12, then we call those founders, we had uh, a group of 55, 54 bisons. And at the end, uh, thanks to those 54 bisons, we have now the, <laughs> the population that we have in Europe in different parts of Europe. And now we count more than 6,000 bison. They are all coming from that group of 12. So does that cause problems within the bison to be descended from so few? There is inbreeding going on because they are so related. If we think that in the case of the humans, if we have like very related humans, then the newborn, the child will, will have problems. And so you've been, you've been gathering this DNA data, haven't you? I think you got some data in, in July and you're going to hopefully come up with some answers. Yeah, we've been collecting more than uh, around 300 cats in July, but we need to actually collect also other data because the DNA quality from the cats is not that high. We will need tissue sample or blood sample. So far, they haven't seen any mutations in the bison, but geneticists are being brought in to analyse the samples, which will guide decisions around introducing more bison to the area. Every time we reintroduce bison in our wild system, we are actually reintroducing uh, animals that have been in captivity, so they are pretty used to the humans, and those are more likely to generate conflicts. So what kind of conflict? So we define a conflict uh, as the outcome of a, a negative outcome of an interaction. Those, conf those outcomes could be uh, economically, uh, emotionally, for example. Economically, we can talk about crop damage, and locals are not happy about that. And, uh, for example, in Poland, there has been a study. They have estimated in 10 years a loss of more than 200,000 euros. That's a lot. We just hear from the locals. So this is pretty hard to quantify. But we do expect that the animals from captivity are producing those damages because the animals that are in the wild actually will avoid the human. That's our expectation. Here in Amanish, over nine kilometres of electric fencing has been installed and a team proactively intervened to prevent potential conflicts. There are also education sessions to help locals better understand the species. The people in the village are learning that supporting and protecting the bison not only benefits the environment, but also the local economy. With many people moving out of the area to look for work, We Wilder's development of ecotourism built around the bison promised a sustainable future. But to succeed, they also need income generating ideas. Elena Floroy is taking us to Mumahut, another place for tourists to stay, named after the grandmother of the family who owned this land. So, this is the very first hut you built, but we're a good 15 minute drive from your other place. Yeah, well, we are distributing uh, our uh, goodies, uh, and this is Muma Hut, which actually uh, is really nice because it's in the middle of nature, and it's specifically for people who, who like to contemplate and uh, find some, uh, some inner peace. This, in turn, uh, gives a stream of income to the locals, uh, the Hurduzeu family, with which we are working here. We are in a joint venture, let's say. And this is a good recipe to bring benefits from nature to the local community. We Wilder understands that nature must flourish for the economic development to be a success. Juana is hopeful it will provide a fertile climate for smaller business startups. So what are we looking for? We are looking for some really special clay, which has a really rare combination of sand inside. One of our uh, main building team and architects uh, was inspired to try and make some natural tiles for some of our natural building projects. Being here or having the privilege to be here because of the bison, it's our duty to really think holistically and, you know, what kind of micro society that is based on nature could we help to steer or nudge or revive. Because locals back in the day, they would have a really good relationship with nature. They would live with the seasons and that's why we've got this sort of wild area still living. Back at the Wewilder hub, Bibi and Dosia Vila are preparing lunch. 
They are employed by Wewalda, providing meals and gastronomic experiences like this one. We are uh, cooking something very uh, spectacular. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's called Balmash. Uh, Dosia and Bibi are our colleagues and uh, they specialize in this uh, special show, special treat. Mm -hmm. uh, that is, uh, you know, the shepherd's breakfast. It Ooh. contains uh, all the goods. Some... A lot of cheese, I can see. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. And, uh, Tokana and salata. Salata yeah. and tokana. Yes. Yeah. Bibi and Dosia belong to one of 30 families in a village of 2,000 people who've been employed because of the bison rewilding project. So what has Wewilder brought to your community? Uh, can I say that after what has brought the community from Armenia? When we came to Wewilder in the zone here, we have developed the zone. We uh, have come to double the number of tourists. Din cauza zimbrilor, din cauza lui Walder, din cauza uh, începerii proiectului și facerii locurilor de cazare a turiștilor. E o, o binecuvântare, o, un prospect început care ridică zona, care scoate zona în evidență. Devine mult mai cunoscut armeniștiu decât o fost datorită oamenilor care vin să viziteze și... Bineînțeles, al lui Walder, că ei au venit cu îmbunătățiri ca să poată să fie cât mai cunoscut și mai... So, it's good for the community, for having We Wilder and the Bison here. Deci, în concluzie, e bine că We Wilder și VVF și Rewilding Europe sunt aici? Da. 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 Yes. Da. Yes. yes. <laughs> da. da. Yeah. The Wewalda team see themselves as an intermediary between locals and tourists, and the pricing model includes a conservation levy that will fund ongoing work in the area. It's certainly been an immersive and enjoyable experience for myself and the crew, and our stomachs have never been empty. But our trip won't be complete until we've seen the bison. We have one more day in the mountains, so we can only hope the GPS is working well and that the motorbike riders are having a day off. We are going into a different area today. We have our bison whisperer back with us, Matei. So yeah, fingers crossed, today is the day. Okay, we'll start uh, walking from here. Yeah. We'll try to reach uh, on top mm -hmm. on the ridge and uh, we'll uh, again look for fresh tracks. Okay, Any we'll on, anything on the GPS today? Yeah, we have a GPS position from the morning uh, around here a bit further okay. up, close to the ridge. Brilliant. We'll try to get there and uh, that's... Hopefully that's they're the still there yeah. and they're moving slowly this morning. Yeah. <laughs> We already have some uh, fresh tracks here, probably okay. from during the night, because yeah. the, the bison, they roam around. Mm -hmm. The herd should be a bit further up towards the ridge, okay. but we can have a male or maybe some females just roaming around the herd, so they can be anywhere. So it will be important for us to walk silently as much as possible, okay. and we'll pay attention at the noises left and right of the trail, okay? Right. Okay, let's go. So, Matei, you're a local. Have you always known how to track? Because bison only arrived in 2014. Yes, well, actually, regarding the bison, I got more experience in time, mm -hmm. but uh, I always like to track mm -hmm. because I think if you if you know tracks and signs can really help you to understand what's happening in an area in nature. Yeah. And you know this area. And of course, I know this area. Yeah. And uh, but during this time, I also participated to some uh, really nice. Uh, uh, cyber tracker uh, evaluations. Okay. Uh, cyber tracker tra tracking was it's, it's an organization which actually started in South Africa, okay. which uh, which really good trackers, yeah. and then uh, expanded to Europe also. Oh. So by participating to these uh, evaluations, I managed to meet uh, really good trackers and uh, exchange uh, experience, and uh, really helps you to to know more about tracking. Okay.
It was a magical moment, hearing the bison communicate. It was only later we found out just how rare it is. So rare, the scientists asked for our audio recording. So we have this male, adult male, which is looking at us. Yeah. He's confident. Usually the males are confident. Yeah. They don't get scared as easy as the, as the females. This is the happy walk of someone who has seen bison in the wild, thanks to our bison whisperer, Matei, legend, <laughs> as he quietly walks away. How big do you think that herd was today? I spotted at least uh, six or seven females, mm -hmm. one adult male, and uh, I think there are at least two or three calves from this year. Yeah. Isn't it unusual to have a male and with a with the, with, the, with the women, <laughs> with the females? Well, uh, you, in the, most of the, of the year, the males are staying alone mm -hmm. or they form groups of two or three males. But now uh, it's still mating season. Mm. It should be over. But uh, because we brought females from captivity, they are not adjusted properly to the mating season yet. Okay. So they can mate even uh, later in the mating season. I so think it's the case now because that's why we still have the male with, uh, with this herd. So it takes a few years for them to adjust, does it? Yes, they need uh, a couple of years, usually two, three years. Mm -hmm. So uh, they need uh, to experience a couple of winters to be able to adjust to the mating season, basically. Yeah. Okay, okay. Because we were making actually quite a lot of noise in the, in the leaves, weren't we? I was surprised that they didn't bolt. Yeah, we were a bit lucky actually because of the, of the wind. It was quite windy up there on the ridge. And it was a lot of noise around them, right, already because of the wind. Lots of branches moving, uh, lots of leaves falling down. Mm -hmm. So we could approach and we could stay quite close, actually. I think we were like 20, 30 meters away from the bison without them uh, being able to, to hear us, which was quite, it was quite amazing. Yeah. I found it really special when we were walking up the track and, and we suddenly we could hear them and it wasn't just the cracking of branches, that was almost like a, a low sort of purring. It was the mother and the calf which were communicating uh, between them. So it was a, a high pitch uh, uh, sound which was, which was from the calf mm -hmm. and then uh, we heard the, a lower sound which was the, the, the female. Mm -hmm. And they were communicating because it's a very dense forest, lots of bushes there. And probably the mother couldn't see the calf and the calf couldn't see the mother and they were like just trying to get uh, one to the other one and uh, communicating between them, yeah. Oh, it was quite nice. I mean, I found it unbelievably special today. Do you still get that same feeling? I mean, you, you do this all the time. Yes, but yeah, even for me, it's, it, it's quite a nice experience because uh, of course it's, I, like, I like this process of uh, quite a lot of like seeing the fresh tracks, the fresh signs, then to be able to hear them and eventually to see them. It's like the perfect way to see wildlife, right? At the beginning, we heard them just a bit, then we were uh, hearing them uh, more loud, and then eventually we m managed to see them. So it was a really, a really nice experience, yeah. So you were smiling as much as I was then? Yeah. <laughs>
the wild populations of bison are increasing around Europe. However, the species is still in danger, listed as near threatened on the red list of the International Union for Conservation of Nature. Thank you. Incredible experience, and thank you for looking after the, the crew as thank well. Thank you very much, Jason. Is it really noticeable, the, the impact that they're having on the environment? Yes, well, we see like lots of small things, lots of interactions the bison have, for example, with, with other animals. We see like the, the birds which are collecting the fur uh, of the bison in the, in the spring uh, because uh, basically the bison lose the winter coat. And uh, we see the birds collecting the fur and putting it in the nest because of course it's a much better insulator than, uh, than uh, the, the wood or the materials they can uh, find around. So good for keeping the diversity in the meadows where they roam around because they can disperse the seeds of the plants uh, so well. Of course, also the other herbivores, they do the same thing, but just the bison are doing it at a much larger scale. Imagine a herd of 30 bison just passing through a meadow, how many seeds they can carry through the, through the fur and they just disperse them through all, all the meadows around, which is really good for maintaining the very rich diversity that we still have in the meadows around. So it's all worth it? Yes, of course. I think, yeah, uh, the place of the bison is in the wild and they can do so much good for the nature, so of course it's, it's worth it, yeah. I owe you a drink. Let's head back. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> we often say that we're saving the bison, but I think uh, that the bison are really saving us. Juana is right. Remember, there were only 12 European bison left, and now there are almost 7,000 around the continent. So this is a story of hope turned to action. And yet success is far from certain, with continuing habitat loss, a narrow genetic base, and the lack of European-wide strategy still the biggest obstacles. When we save an ecosystem, we're not just talking about saving animals that few of us will see, we're also talking about saving ourselves, because we rely on thriving ecosystems just as much as they do.